Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, as part of our Nuclear Fortnight series, where we remember the 75th anniversary of the only use of atomic weapons in combat, uh, we will be talking about some of the post-war tests with nuclear weapons, specifically the Abel and Baker tests at Bikini Atoll, Operation Crossroads. So, up to this point, three atomic weapons have been used. There was the bomb test at Trinity, then there was the uh, bombing of Hiroshima, and then Nagasaki. Uh, these took place in July and August of 1945. World War II ended. Uh, the United States had about a half a dozen other atomic weapons in their arsenal at this point, uh, and there started to be discussion about testing them. Um, when we talk about battleships, there are certain points that get brought up over and over and over again. Uh, things like the Washington and London Naval Treaties, the Dreadnought Revolution, uh, and Billy Mitchell's tests. So in the post-war world, the uh, whether or not we were going to uh, continue to fund the Navy was in question, um, and the tests Billy Mitchell had done in the 1920s to show battleships were vulnerable to aircraft drop bombs, uh, which also included the expenditure of the first USS New Jersey BB-16, uh, those tests were really bad for the Navy. The Navy didn't want those tests, and uh, the Army was able to prove their points. So the Navy wanted to get ahead of the atomic question quickly. So they took a leading role in what would become Operation Crossroads and even selected uh, over 90 of their own ships to be used uh, in these tests to prove that battleships could survive atomic bombs. So that comes up again. In the post-war world, uh, atomic weapons are now seen as a war-ending uh, technology Nobody will go to war with an atomic power, because if they do, we'd just nuke them and that would be the end of it. Uh, so, the only weapon systems you need are nuclear weapon delivery systems. In this case, Air Force long-range bombers. Uh, well, still Army Air Corps at this point, but soon to be Air Force. So, in the post-war budget-cutting world, there is now a question of, do we need a Navy at all? Do we need an Army, or should we just break out the Army Air Corps and use that? Um, so, as part of the fight over funding, the suggestion comes up that ships are obsolete because an A-bomb can destroy a fleet of ships. And ships do not yet have the capability of deploying atomic weapons themselves. Uh, the atomic projectiles used in Iowa-class battleships, 16-inch uh, shells, will not be developed for another 10 years. The uh, bombers that deliver atomic bombs are still much too large to fly off of aircraft carriers. Uh, and although the first missiles are starting to be developed, they're still a couple of years out from deployment, and uh, they are very, very large uh, and would be hard to retrofit a warship to carry them at this point. So, several people from Congress, from the Army, from the Navy, all suggest around the same time that uh, we should test atomic bombs on warships. There is a surplus of these ships lying around. We've captured a bunch of German and Japanese ships at the end of the war, uh, and we have a ton of pre-war ships which are more or less obsolete now uh, thanks to all of the wartime construction that has been built. The Iowa-class battleships render the nearly two dozen pre-war battleships in the U.S. arsenal completely obsolete. They're too slow and small, and their uh, armor and guns just don't hold up to the more modern ship. So they are expendable. 
So, uh, it's decided to form a joint task force to test atomic weapons on ships. All three bombs have been detonated over land at this point. So, they come up with three tests, which will be called Abel, Baker, and Charlie, uh, which will be done in mid-46 and early-47. And they're going to assemble a fleet of ships and drop a bomb on them and see what happens. The Navy is betting that the atomic bomb will not destroy its ships and thus not render it obsolete. Uh, the Army is betting that it will destroy the ships, and uh, Congress just wants to know where to put their limited funds. So, in the end, 95 ships are selected for these tests. That is larger than the sixth largest fleet in the world at that time. And these are all just old obsolete ships that the United States has laying around. Uh, these ships include three captured uh, German and Japanese ships, the battleship Nagato, from which the order to attack Pearl Harbor was given, the uh, Bismarck's one-time consort Prinz Eugen, the heavy cruiser, uh, and another Japanese cruiser are all selected. Of the 92 American ships used, there are four battleships. The four older ones in the arsenal. Arkansas, Nevada, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, there were two aircraft carriers. Poor Saratoga that never got into a fight that she didn't get damaged in. Uh, and the light carrier Independence. Two heavy cruisers, Salt Lake City and Pensacola, the first American heavy cruisers, 13 destroyers, 8 submarines, uh, and the rest, auxiliaries and amphibious warfare ships, uh, were all used for this test. Now, as this was being put together, the argument started to come up that the ships probably won't be destroyed, uh, but that doesn't mean the crews wouldn't be. So... They decided to use animals to simulate human beings on the ships. And some 200 pigs, 60 guinea pigs, 204 goats, 5,000 rats, and 200 mice were brought in to uh, man this fleet of ships, which would normally have approximately 35,000 sailors and marines on board. Uh, the ships were placed in partial uh, levels of loading. Some of them had full ammunition and fuel loadouts. Some of them had uh, partial loadouts. Some, many of them had aircraft or other vehicles on their decks to see what the explosion would do to that. Uh, other ordnance laid around. So that uh, rather than testing what a fleet at Anchorage would be like, they wanted to test a number of things with one shot. So they anchored the ships much closer together than would be normal. Uh, and rather than having them fully loaded like they would normally be at Anchorage uh, or unloaded, they, they put them in partial levels. Uh, and this was somewhat to test how ships react at different levels and somewhat because uh, there was some thought that if these ships are fully loaded with fuel and ammunition, there will be secondary explosions which will destroy them. But we want to do multiple tests, so we don't want to just destroy all the ships outright with one test. Uh, so, some of them will be unloaded, some of them will be loaded. Uh, and as it turns out, there, there weren't too, too many secondary explosions. The, the poor, already beat-up aircraft carrier Saratoga uh, with fueled and armed aircraft already on the flight deck and hangar did suffer secondary explosions that, that did some pretty bad damage to her during the first test, uh, but she was able to be salvaged for a second test. As part of this test, some 42,000 primarily U.S. Navy sailors, but also uh, Army personnel and civilian scientists participated. Um, and this was an extremely advanced scientific endeavor. Eight of the venerable B-17 Flying Fortresses were equipped with state-of-the-art autopilots and loaded with test sensors 
so that they could be flown through the mushroom cloud and around the uh, explosion site when the bombs go off to collect more data that uh, manned aircraft couldn't do. There was a uh, human rights toll to this experiment. Bikini Atoll and uh, the nearby islands were not uninhabited. There were 167 natives on Bikini. Uh, the island had been part of the Japanese mandate pre-war, and in February of 46, Truman said that uh, any Japanese islands now belong to the United States. So uh, America's history of colonialism isn't as bad as European nations, uh, but in this instance, we sent the uh, military governor of the islands to uh, Bikini to uh, negotiate with King Judah, and they had a verbal agreement. There's not even a written agreement of what was said um, and uh, so the 167 natives were temporarily relocated to another island. Uh, as it turns out, uh, because these were tests and we didn't really know what the results were going to be, uh, one of the tests caused a lot of radiation in the area and... Uh, the islands are still uninhabited to this day. Uh, the tests that were performed in 1946 were not the final tests. Uh, every time the islanders wanted to come back, uh, further tests were proposed. And uh, in the mid-70s, a couple of islanders came back, and then uh, their subsistence farming could no longer work, and uh, the fish that they were eating were all contaminated. So within a couple of years, they had to be evacuated again for fear of uh, high radiation. So, uh, the two tests were performed on July 1st, 1946, and for this test, uh, one of the aircraft that had uh, been a part of the Nagasaki raid, one of the observation aircraft, dropped a plutonium bomb similar to the Fat Man bomb that was used on Nagasaki, a 23 kiloton device, named Gilda, uh, and they dropped it to burst uh, about five or six hundred feet above the fleet of ships. Now these bombs have notoriously unknown flight characteristics because there just weren't many of them dropped, and uh, they missed the target by some 700 yards. Subsequent tests showed that their bomb site was working, uh, but by missing the target ship, which was the bright orange painted battleship Nevada. Check out this picture. She was already squat and wide like a pumpkin and then you paint her orange. Uh, so they were supposed to be able to see that ship among all of the other 94 vessels there and drop their bomb on her. Well, they missed by 700 yards. Uh, and so rather than getting a good test on the epicenter of the fleet, they missed the bulk of the fleet. Uh, now this proved that ships close to the atomic blast, but not directly in it, just some 700 yards away, were more or less immune. Uh, approximately 35% of the animals during this test were killed, but the other two thirds survived. Uh, the ships were not contaminated with radiation. Most of the radiation went up into the stratosphere. It didn't go down onto the ships. Uh, and so this test proved that battleships could survive an air burst explosion, as well as most smaller ships. There were some that were sunk, uh, ones close to the explosion, primarily auxiliaries and destroyers. Um, and it proved that uh, inside the ships you were more or less protected from radiation from an air burst explosion. So the um, explosion uh, leaving the ships not radioactive and in good shape by and large. Several sustained damage. Poor Saratoga, uh, which is purely held together by duct tape at this point in her long career. Uh, this gives uh, evaluators 
a chance to go on board and look at the ships and, and see what the damage is. And uh, for the battleships, it's light to moderate. Uh, Nagato was rated as moderate damage, but she had unrepaired damage from American bombing raids during World War II, so she was already damaged when she was being uh, inspected. So, uh, yeah, air burst, completely survivable. So the next test, which took place uh, on the 25th of July, about three weeks later, uh, was going to be an underwater detonation. So they suspended the bomb about 100 feet deep in the water below uh, one of the auxiliaries uh, there. That auxiliary, by the way, was never found. The entire ship is believed to have been completely vaporized by the explosion. So, if that's any indication of how this test is going to go, turns out underwater explosions much more effective than airburst when it comes to hitting ships. So, uh, obviously the bomb being suspended underwater did not miss the target. It vaporized the water around it superheated the water and, and vaporized it, created a cavity in the ocean uh, that some of the ships close to just fell into and were swallowed up by. Uh, and then it created a huge column of water. Here's the famous picture of the uh, explosion at Bikini Atoll. See those little black dots on the bottom? Those are battleships and aircraft carriers. Over 700 feet long, 30,000 tons each, uh, and they show up in this picture as little specks. Uh, some of those specks you can see are sticking straight up in the air on the side of the column. Uh, the closest battleship to the explosion, the old Arkansas, World War I era dreadnought. Uh, well, we don't know where her guns and superstructure went. Could have been vaporized, could be under the wreck. But uh, one entire side of the ship just disappeared. She rolled over topside and sank in the mud. Uh, when divers went down to inspect her, the, it turns out the explosion had dug out so much of the bottom of the lagoon uh, that the, the first diver to go down sunk up to his waist in radioactive mud while trying to look at the wreck. So they called off further uh, examinations there, uh, and Arkansas is still in the bottom of the lagoon. Other ships uh, didn't necessarily sink outright, but the water that was thrown up over them uh, was so radioactive that the ships themselves became radioactive. And this was something that the tests didn't predict. They, they knew that uh, an amount of water was going to be thrown in the air and that water would be radioactive and that radioactive water would hit some of the ships. All of the ships were contaminated, massively contaminated. So they sent crews on board after a couple of days as the radiation uh, went down enough for them to reboard. And uh, if you look at these pictures, these guys aren't wearing any special clothes at all. They're just wearing their regular uniforms. Uh, and there was no procedure to wash down a ship. So they just washed it down the way they would normally scrub a ship, with soap and water and uh, scrub brushes. Uh, and some of the ships that were really contaminated, they, they brought fire ships up to and pumped water from the lagoon onto the ships via fire hoses. Well, turns out that water, radioactive too, didn't really work. Didn't really work. Um, all of the animals in this experiment died if not outright in the explosion, then because they were left on these ships for days and days after the explosion, uh, because people couldn't reboard them because they were so radioactive. Uh, and that would have likely been the fate of the crew. So, uh, for example, on the battleship Nevada, a sailor, I believe he was a pig, uh, died within two days when standing out on the main deck of the ship. Inside of the heavily armored gun turret, the uh, animal sailor there, I believe it was another pig, uh, 
only received 10% of the radiation dosage because they were behind so much armor, means they survived another two days uh, and died after four days. So uh, the crews of these ships, very susceptible, even though the ships themselves by and large stayed afloat. Now, just because they survived the tests doesn't mean they could survive indefinitely. Without crews on board uh, and with the uh, salvage parties unable to reboard because of the radioactivity, uh, some of these ships began to sink just because they had leaks, because they were old ships that had been used through the war. Uh, and some of them had sustained very mild damage in the explosion, which led to leaks that caused them to sink. Uh, and the crews just weren't able to get on board and activate the pumps, which could have saved the ships. Uh, but they would have still been highly radioactive. Um, ships like the German cruiser Prinz Eugen, they, she was so radioactive they couldn't make repairs to save her, so she ended up being uh, towed away and sunk, and she's still there. Uh, and at the time, they weren't even able to drain her oil, and a very recent uh, survey found that her tanks were about to explode and release hundreds of gallons of, or thousands of gallons of oil into the ocean, and uh, they were able to go in and cut open her tanks and salvage it safely. Uh, but she's still there. If you go on Google Earth and start looking around, uh, I believe it's Kwajalein, you can see her stern still sticking out of the water, possibly even glowing green. I'm not sure about that. So the Baker test was a huge disaster. Um, way more radioactive than was predicted, uh, to the point that they canceled the Charlie test altogether and did not bring the locals back. Uh, the locals continued to live on Rangarak, where they had been uh, moved to. So, uh, what are the legacies of this test? Well, the U.S. Navy developed a very successful uh, torpedo design, which was a nuclear bomb inside of a torpedo that submarines could launch, which would explode underwater under a fleet and probably destroy that launching submarine, but would also destroy that fleet. Uh, luckily, that was never deployed in combat. Uh, these tests may have led to the birth of museum ships. The battleship Texas, the next oldest museum ship, uh, would have probably been expended in this test as well, except the state of Texas was able to grab her and turn her into the first modern museum ship. The states of New York and Pennsylvania also tried to save their namesake battleships but were not able to get enough interest to do that. Uh, subsequent attempts to save museum ships were able to generate more success and were successful, even leading up to this ship. So in some ways, uh, we can attribute the survival of these World War II vessels to the atomic bombs. These tests also led to the birth of the popular swimsuit known as the bikini. Uh, so a French fashion designer, uh, so French fashion sure didn't wait long after the end of World War II, but a French fashion designer has uh, just come up with a two-part bathing suit uh, that scandalously shows a woman's midriff. And he wanted, uh, something that elicited uh, how powerful this look was and also how primitive this look was. So he thought by tying it in with the nuclear explosions, the very popular and well-known tests which were happening at Bikini Atoll, that uh, he would get good publicity for his swimwear. I dare say that that worked. The bathing suit is still here. It is still known as the bikini. Maybe we don't necessarily remember why, uh, but it certainly led to a revolution in fashion. These tests also gave us the uh, 
really only good picture of the formation of a mushroom cloud. Here's that famous picture of uh, the Baker test at Bikini Island, again, with those small ships in it. Uh, a picture like this was not able to be gotten with any of the airburst tests because there was a blinding flash of light associated with splitting an atom in half. Uh, because that happened underwater, photographers were able to get this great picture uh, with these great ships in it for scale to show just how massive and powerful the explosion was. Uh, like I've said before, the islands were rendered uninhabitable to this day. Uh, it led to new features on warships. Warships built following uh, the Baker tests have uh, countermeasure washdown systems built in where if they think they're going to be destroyed by atomic blasts uh, or hit by radiation, they start pumping seawater through this washdown system, uh, which will help wash off any of the radioactive debris as it hits the ship, so they do not become as radioactive as the ships at uh, Baker at, uh, at Bikini Atoll were during the Baker tests. Uh, obviously, this has never been tested in combat, and it was never specifically retrofitted on Iowa-class battleships, uh, although they did receive some other uh, countermeasure implementations for nuclear and biological and chemical warfare. Uh, so in theory, these ships uh, were refitted by the 80s so that they can completely seal up the inside of the ship and be airtight, watertight, so stuff can't get in. Uh, they also have a fire main system on the exterior of the ship from which you can run fire hoses all over the ship into a makeshift washdown system. And here are some pictures of Wisconsin uh, in the Persian Gulf set up like that uh, for fear of Iraqi chemical weapons. But uh, this system could also be used against, uh, against nuclear fallout. And of course, the most lasting legacy of the bomb tests at Bikini Atoll is the cartoon SpongeBob, which uses Bikini Bottom as its uh, setting because all of those fish are supposed to have been uh, made radioactive by the tests. So, thanks for watching today. If you have any questions or comments about the tests at uh, Bikini Atoll, the Operations Crossroad, drop them in the comment section down below. Do you think New Jersey could survive a nuclear blast? Let us know down below. If you would like to support our channel uh, and our museum, check the description below for ways you can donate uh, and also for our other videos on uh, as part of our Nuclear Fortnite series where we talk about atomic weapons. Uh, and finally, remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we put out more content. See you next time.